Well, good evening, Sierra Bible Church. My name's Glenn. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, and it's going to be my great privilege tonight to guide us through a time of reflecting on Good Friday. Um, it's going to be an opportunity for us to sing and to pray, uh, to praise God. Um, and we're also going to be taking communion. We'll be having some scripture reading um, as well that I will be leading us through. We're basically going to be just following through the story through the Gospel of Matthew tonight together. I'll be doing some reading and giving you some opportunities and some moments where you can reflect on uh, what, what we are processing together tonight. Um, feel free uh, during this entire service, um, if you need, a, need some space or you, you need to move around the, the sanctuary or find a different space to be by yourself or to come together, uh, feel free to do so. I'm also not going to be telling you to stand or sit. So if, if, if you're in a place where you're like, I just need to sit and reflect on some things, do that. If you're at a spot where you want to stand and worship and praise, do that. Uh, so this is, this is kind of free form a little bit tonight for all of you. So, um, so feel free to express yourself as, as God leads you in, in as, uh, those regards. Uh, additionally, we have communion that is set up here uh, at the front. We have two places, two tables that are set up. Um, the way we're going to do communion tonight is just as we're reflecting on different points of Good Friday, of the different things Jesus endured on our behalf, um, at any point during any of the songs, uh, until up, up until the last song that we're going to do, um, feel free to get up and take communion. You can take communion back to your seat. You can take it at the table. You can grab somebody, pray together, take communion together. But basically, at any point during the music, throughout the entire service, will be the time where you can uh, come up and take communion. I'd encourage you not to just wait till the very last minute so there's not a bad dash. But... Uh, just as you're processing and reflecting, do so. I do want to uh, also let you know, if you are not yet a follower of Jesus or you're not sure or you don't know what that means to follow Jesus, uh, communion is for, or for those who are presently walking with Jesus, who are, who are by faith, putting their hope and faith in him and living with him. And so if you're not a Christian, if you're not sure if you're a Christian, if you're not sure if you're a follower of Jesus, uh, d don't take communion tonight. Uh, if you have questions about that, you can talk with me uh, afterwards. The final thing... Uh, uh, that I will let you know uh, is as we close tonight, um, Good Friday is a very somber evening as we reflect on all that Jesus endured for us. And we want to practice a little bit of, of that same sorrow that Jesus' disciples endured on that Good Friday. And so at the close of the service, uh, there's going to be no chatting. There's going to be no talking, no catching up. And so just, we're just going to depart in silence um, as we let the weight of the crucifixion of the Son of God Way on us. And so I'm going to um, pray, and I'm going to open us in Matthew's gospel before we start our singing tonight. So let's pray together. Father, what a great and terrible event that occurred when the God of the universe was crucified for sinners. But, Father, we come tonight recognizing how good that sacrifice is for us, how we are able to be made right before you. And so, God, as we reflect tonight together as your people, God, would you speak to us? Would you move in us? Would your spirit um, create in us a longing for Resurrection Sunday as we reflect on this Good Friday? It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Here's how Matthew starts um, this is after, this is in, uh, in the upper room as they are finished eating. Jesus is going to introduce the Lord's Supper. And here's what Matthew 26, 26 uh, through 35 says. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup. And when he'd given thanks, he gave, uh, he gave it to them. And he said, drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. And Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. 
Peter answered him, though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of the disciples said the same. So let's sing together of this man of sorrows.
Matthew continues in his gospel. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. Taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, so could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away, and he prayed. My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came, and he found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And so leaving them again, he went away, and he prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. And he came to the disciples, and he said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayed is at hand. In the midst of the most trying and taxing time that any human being has ever faced, Jesus was alone. He was abandoned. His friends, who should have been able to support him, couldn't keep their eyes open. No one encouraged him as he went. The burden that Jesus would carry, he would carry completely alone. Jesus knows what it's like to be alone. He knows what it's like to feel abandoned. Jesus was abandoned for you and for me so that we would never truly be alone. Because of Jesus, God is present with you as his follower now and forever. You never have to be lonely again. I'm going to give us just a few moments. Just give you some space to confess before God in silent prayer. Your loneliness. How you feel abandoned. And commit to remind yourself this evening. God is with you. Because Jesus was made alone in your place. So take a few moments to pray before God.
Matthew continues. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs for the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign saying, the one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, do what you came to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew a sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my father and he will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? In that hour, Jesus said to the crowds, have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day, I sat in the temple teaching, and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place, that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And then all the disciples left him and fled. One of the men who Jesus confided in, who he shared an intimate relationship with a friend, a close friend, person, somebody he trusted, somebody he cared for. This person betrayed him to make a quick buck. Even up until the last moment, Judas kept the the charade going, kissing him as a act of greeting, making it become an act of betrayal. Jesus knew what it meant to have those closest to you betray you, to turn on you. He knows what, it like, what it's like for those, um, for those who are closest to you to turn on you. He was betrayed for you and for me. Jesus will never betray you. He will never seek out his own interests at your expense. In fact, so deep is Jesus' commitment to you that he's tied his own good, his own glory, to doing good to you as his follower. And so now as we are reflecting on how Jesus was betrayed, spend a moment thanking God that Jesus never will betray you.
Then those who had seized Jesus led him to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders had gathered. And Peter was following him at a distance, as far as the courtyard of the high priest. Going inside, he sat with the guards to see the end. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death, but they found none, though many false witnesses came forward. At last, two came forward and said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. And the high priest stood up and said, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But Jesus remained silent. And the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his robes and said, he's uttered blasphemy. What further witnesses do we need? You have now heard his blasphemy. What is your judgment? They answered, he deserves death. And then they spit in his face, and they struck him. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, you Christ. Who is it that struck you? Jesus was accused of crimes that he did not commit. He had his words twisted and used against him. Those who should have embraced him and received him gladly rejected him. Jesus knows what it means to be wrongly accused. He knows what it's like to be blamed. He was accused for you and for me. There is an enemy who accuses you before God and man. Satan is called the accuser of the brothers. You hear his whispers in your head as you replay every failure of the day or of your life. As you're lying on your pillow, you see your failures, and it's his voice that brings those back out to accuse you. He brings his case against you to God. But because Jesus was accused, no accusation can ever hold weight against you. Even the ones that are true. Either, even the ones for which you are guilty. None can hold weight because of Jesus being accused in your place. So let's thank God this evening. That there's no condemnation for those of us that are in Christ Jesus.
Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard. And a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I don't know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him. And she said to the bystanders, this man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again, he denied it with an oath. I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, well, certainly you two are one of them, for your accent betrays you. And then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately, the rooster crowed. And Peter remembered the saying of Jesus before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out. And he wept bitterly. When it became too costly for Peter to continue to stand beside Jesus, he denied him. He left. Instead of supporting Jesus in his hour of need, Peter chose to save his skin and died that, denied that he even knew him. Jesus knows what it's like for others to deny you. To hear only silence when you ought to hear support. Jesus was denied by others for you and for me. You and I have done things to embarrass others and to cause them to distance them from us. Our failures our attitudes, our words, our actions. But not Jesus. He does not distance himself from you. He will never deny you. Even at your worst moments, Jesus looks to you and says, that one is mine. Jesus was denied so that you never truly could be. Let's take a moment and thank God that he has made us his through his son, Jesus. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even a sing- to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to releasing for the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had then a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they gathered, Pilate said to them, who do you want for me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ? For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife had sent word to him saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release for you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? They all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and on our children. Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, delivered him to be crucified. Then the soldiers of the governor took Jesus into the governor's headquarters, and they gathered the whole battalion before him, and they stripped him, and they put a scarlet robe on him, and twisting together a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and put a reed in his right hand. And kneeling before him, they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they spit on him, and they took the reed and struck him on the head. And when they had mocked him, they stripped him of the robe and put his own clothes on him and led him away to crucify him. Jesus endured suffering on his way to the cross. He endured the physical suffering of whips and thorns and dust and exhaustion. But he also endured emotional and psychological suffering as he was mocked and ridiculed. Jesus knows what it's like to suffer. He suffered for you and for me. For those of us who are in Christ, all of our suffering is but a momentary affliction. While pain and suffering endure in this life, a day is coming when it will be removed. And none of our present pain will be wasted. God is working all things for our good as we love Jesus. Because Jesus suffered, our suffering becomes both worth it and temporary. Ask God now for a moment in prayer that he would help you trust in Jesus in the midst of your pain, knowing Jesus knows exactly what it is like. So take a moment to pray.
this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, which means place of the skull, they offered him wine to drink mixed with gall. But when he tasted it, he would not drink it. And when they had crucified him, they divided his garments among them by casting lots. Then they sat down and they kept watch over him there. And over his head, they put the charge against him, which read, 
This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Then two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right, one on the left. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you're the son of God, come down from the cross. So also the chief priests with the scribes and elders mocked him saying, oh, he saved others, he cannot save himself. Oh, he's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God deliver him now if he desires him. For he said, I'm the son of God. And the robbers who were crucified with him also reviled him in the same way. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lema sabachthani. That is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of the bystanders hearing it said, this man's calling Elijah. One of them at once ran in, took a sponge, filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and gave it to him to drink. But the others said, wait, let's see whether Elijah will come save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice. He yielded up his spirit. Jesus died. His death was real. It was not an act. What they took off of the cross was a corpse. He faced the faith that every human being must face. The author of life made to die. Jesus knows what it means to live with a death sentence hanging over you. And then to die. Jesus died for you and for me. You and I will one day die. One day it'll be our corpse that lies in a grave. But not forever. No, for us, death will only be temporary. Why? Because Jesus died. His death saves us from the second death. And one day, death and all of its effects will only be a memory. Thank God this evening that for those of us in Christ, we will never taste the second death. This my plea. Nothing. 
nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. services here at Sierra Bible Church, um, we like to conclude with a benediction, which is simply a blessing for the road. We're going to get that blessing on Sunday. But for tonight, the way we're going to dismiss ourselves, is we're going to sing one last song. And we're going to allow the sorrow of Good Friday to hang over us. So at the conclusion of this last song, we're not going to dismiss anything. We're not going to, to announce anything. It's just time for us to depart in silence as we head back to our homes to long for Easter Sunday together. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, 
This gift of love and righteousness